the show starts in three, two, one, go. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's December the 1st, 2022. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Kanesport.com. Joined this morning by our two young superstars, Stephen Wagner and Azubi Charles, as we discuss the news of the day. Presented today by Caneswear, your cane shop for all your holiday needs, and by Life Wallet, where the time is now to take charge of your personal health and do NIL deals with a bunch of new hurricanes, hopefully, <laughs> in the near future. Um, guys, I got to begin today on a somber note before we get to the news of the day. And I have to offer a heartfelt apology to our colleague, Matt Shodell. Because yesterday we were talking about the absolutely outrageous excitement. I mean, just great excitement of the flip from Michigan of Collins after Mapong to Miami and all of the things that that potentially could mean for the Hurricanes defensive line moving forward. And Holy cow! He like he, he's drinking some some magic potion too, Azubi. He doesn't have much uh, ginger juice, but he's got something working there. Um, but in, no, in all seriousness. So, and Matt was like so somber on yesterday morning show, and I gave him a hard time. I'm like, Matt, what? This is a big deal, man. Like everybody's all excited out here in Kane's Nation. Show some enthusiasm uh, for this flip. I mean, it was a big deal for the Canes. Well, it turns out that while we were doing the show, Matt was being inflicted with COVID, okay? And COVID was just absolutely smothering his body. He was achy. His throat was was getting sore and he could barely talk. Um, he was just really feeling like crap and was in no mood to get excited about a flip from Michigan to Miami. Uh, and I gave him a hard time for that. And so... Matt is off getting healthy. We've, we've got him in quarantine uh, somewhere in, in, in Dade County. And he is locked up in a closet and trying to sweat off the COVID um, virus. Okay. So he doesn't give it to, you know, his wife and anybody else around him. The, the stone crab that sits out on his front porch protesting. Uh, nobody wants to catch COVID from Matt certainly not any of us. So we told Matt, go get better. We got this. And and, and we do. And, and guys, what a, you know, we got a pretty good news day here to talk about. And so let's dive right into it. Stephen, I want to begin with your story on Collins Atramapong again. Uh, we can't get enough of this guy. We, we, we're going to be writing about him every day for the next two weeks. Um, no, but in all seriousness, we got a really good story today um, on Collins. And he is bound and determined to not come to Miami by himself. And if you've been reading our stories, you know that he's formed a very unique friendship with a four-star defensive lineman from Texas by the name of Enau Etta, uh, who now is the highest ranked recruit in Michigan's recruiting class. Well, they're, they're, they're boys, okay? Like, they, they're on the phone with each other. Uh, if, if not hourly, certainly every day. Anytime one of them sees something cool, they tell the other one. I mean, these two are attached at the hip. Collins wants his boy to come to Miami with him. Really, really bad. Uh, Steven, you spoke to him about this. You spoke to the, uh, him about the relationship. Uh, tell us a little bit about this bond that these guys have formed and your impressions just in, in working that story of the chances in your mind that um, Collins is able to get Eno to come to Miami. Yeah. So Collins and Eno, you know, Collins referred to Eno kind of as his brother and kind of, you know, getting the chance to talk to, you know, he, it, it's very apparent why he feels that way. I mean, you know, these are, these are guys who, you know, they're in contact, they're in constant communication with each other. Uh, Collins knows Enal's family. You know he's met his parents. He's met you know his brothers, sisters, siblings, um, all of that stuff. Uh, you know they're in contact. You know constantly, and it, it, it not even about 
you know, Miami and Michigan football stuff. This is just about, you know, hey, I saw something funny on TikTok. I'm going to send it to my boy or, you know, hey, you know, like check out this tweet. Isn't that outrageous? I'm going to send that to my buddy. You know, that, you know, the sort of thing that you really see two close friends just, you know, shooting the, you know, shooting it back and forth with one another. And um, uh, Collins flipped from Michigan uh, or, yeah, flipped from Michigan to Miami. Uh, Eno is still currently committed to Michigan. Uh, but it seems like Collins is really pushing to try to bring Eno uh, to Miami with him. He said, you know, that's my boy, that's my brother, and uh, I want him here in Miami with me. Um, you know, Eno, you know, he has a lot of respect uh, for Jim Harbaugh over there at Michigan, um, but I also know that he had some issues um, with some of the other members of, uh, of Michigan's uh, coaching staff and, you know, kind of – uh, and kind of, you know, with their the relationship that they developed over recruiting, I guess, you know, maybe wasn't necessarily uh, all that he thought it may end up being. And uh, he ended up flipping to uh, he ended up flipping to Miami and he absolutely wants to bring his boy, you know, who is, like you said, the top recruit in Michigan's 2023 class. He wants to bring him with him to Miami. Uh, I did reach out to him on Wednesday and asked Eno uh, kind of what he thought about the idea of coming to Miami. And he simply told me that, uh, you know, he's not really interested in talking right now about, you know, anything related to the Hurricanes or anything related to Collins, which tells me that this is a kid who has been hearing a lot about this. And he is extremely aware of the buzz that's kind of going around surrounding him in this most recent move. Uh, so uh, I, I think that there's a lot of anticipation here on both sides. And right now, this is something where, you know, we can certainly speculate quite a bit. But right now, we're all just kind of waiting to kind of see what happens, because it's very apparent that Collins does want his boy with him in South Beach. Well, they're flipping out in Ann Arbor for sure. I mean, these were the two top recruits on their board. They're number 23 in the on three recruiting rankings, uh, despite their success on the field this year. So there can't be a lot of happiness. And we should also note that Enow was offered by Miami back in May and that Miami has been working on this flip for at least six months. So when they offered him in May, you know that they had a sense that they were going to be getting Collins eventually and that they were going to win this battle. And they set their sights uh, higher and wanted to land both of them. So, uh, yeah, we will uh, continue to track that one. But uh Zuby, I want your prediction on this. You're a young guy. You got your boys. You know, I mean, you know, if, if you had your best friend that was committed with you to a school and he defected and went to another school, um, would you follow? I would have to, you know, test the waters out a little bit because obviously there's something enticing at Miami. I mean, Michigan's coming off the second straight year beating their biggest rival, Ohio State, and I see my best friend flip to Miami. So I'm saying, hey – what's going on down, down there in Coral Gables. So I'm definitely taking a look at it. I understand why he's kind of keeping it to himself. You know, hey, I'm not really saying anything, but I definitely think there has to be some type of interest with him coming to Miami and taking a look at Miami. If they've been constantly pursuing him since he's been offered and same things with Collins, we didn't hear much about it on, you know, social media or things like that. And it just happened out of the blue. So I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up, you know, coming to Miami with him. But if that's me, I'm definitely taking a serious look at, uh, Mario Cristobal and the Hurricanes. Yeah, and if I had, I, I might just go right into the recruiting prediction machine now and make that prediction for him to come to Miami because I agree with you. I, I think there's a great chance that he makes that flip. Now, just to let everybody out there know what's going on in terms of recruiting, uh, the coaches are, are getting ready to hit the road and uh, go out and uh, Miami's not having any official visitors this weekend. They could have if they wanted to. Instead, they're choosing to send the coaches out on the road. Uh, might do the same thing next weekend as well. Like, this is a rare opportunity to go out and see guys, see all your 2023 kids. You'll have Mario Cristobal making home visits to just about everybody. Uh, they'll probably peek in on some 2024 kids as well and uh, start trying to get a head start on 2024 recruiting. So uh, a big few weeks ahead, we will be covering all of it for you at, at canesport.com. The two young guys you're looking at will be getting zero sleep for the next few weeks. We are going to be rocking and rolling, um, and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy all the coverage that we will be bringing to you. Now, 
we are five days away from the transfer portal opening up. And this is going to be absolute insanity, okay? There are already something like 12, 1300 kids that have said that they are going to the transfer portal. And these aren't all just like Jags. Let me tell you something. There are going to be some of these kids that are going to be disappointed. They are not going to find new homes. But there are some really good players that are saying they're going into the transfer portal. Uh, some starting quarterbacks, for example, um, you know, guys that are frontline players at just about every position. And because he recruited the guys at uh, Oregon, I think you got to keep a close eye on duck players going into the portal. And uh, I've been hearing from sources that there's going to be some pretty good ones at Oregon that may not be feeling it with the new staff, may not have been happy with the way the season went. Uh, they've lost three games. They got blown out by Georgia. Uh, might be, you know, looking to test the waters a little bit and see what their market value is by going in the portal. And uh, one of those, Stephen, uh, will come to you again because this was another one of your stories here. Uh, Stephen's been working his butt off, everybody. This is his first week at King Sporties. He's only been uh, with us like three days. He's already worked probably uh, 45 hours this week. So, um, you know, he, he's part saying, what the heck did I get myself into here with this job? But he's also enjoying the heck out of it because of all the good stories that he's finding and doing. And uh, one of those is on Dante Thornton uh, Jr. And he's a receiver at Oregon. He's from Baltimore. Mario Cristobal recruited him there. And um, he's had a pretty pedestrian career uh, at, at Oregon. I mean, it's been okay. He, um, he caught 26 passes uh, for 542 yards and three touchdowns uh, in two seasons. Okay. So, I mean, you know, it's okay. But I think that, you know, he had bigger designs for himself when he came all the way across the country to, to go to Oregon. And uh, Stephen, I got to think that this is one that we got to keep an eye on real close. Uh, he's from the East Coast. He was recruited by Mario Cristobal. Um, I got to think there's a decent chance that Thornton uh, jumps across the country and comes to Miami. And there's a couple Miami guys that are, are trying to pave the way and uh, suggest that to him. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I definitely got to think that there's a pretty good chance that he ends up uh, coming to Miami too. Um, you look at uh, you look at uh, kind of the way that his career's unfolded so far. It definitely hasn't been, uh, you know. I think what he, you know, a kid with offers from Georgia and Ohio State and USC, uh, you know, a, you know every you know respect you know every major Power Five planet under or every major Power Five program under the sun. You know, it, it, it and to only have 542 yards, 26 or 27 receptions, and uh, three touchdowns in two years. Uh, for a kid that has this natural frame, 6'5, 200 pounds, I mean, you know, that's a kid who to me, you know, you look at him and he just kind of pops with potential. You know, he's you know, you you look at you know his his highlight reel, you know, you look at the 66 yard catch. Uh, that he had. You look at a 58-yard reception that he had against Utah this season. Um, you know he's had three receptions of 40 plus yards uh, in each of his first two years of college. And you've got to kind of feel like you know the pieces might kind of be there a little bit. Um, you, you've definitely seen flashes. I think of the player that a lot of people anticipated. Uh, he may be. He certainly hasn't blossomed into it. But he's also just now coming out of his sophomore season. And, you know, there are a lot of players who, you know, it kind of takes until their junior year to pop. Um, you know, freshman year can be a little bit of an adjustment period. And then second year and then your sophomore year, you know, you're kind of getting acclimated to a little bit more playing time. And then third year, you really start to find a little bit of comfort in yourself on the field. Um, you know, now it, it also be important to note uh, that if he did come to Miami, he'd have his third play caller in three seasons uh, with Joe Moorhead, his first year at Oregon, Kenny Dillingham uh, this past this past year at Oregon. And then presumably he would have Josh Gaddis as a play caller and his wide receivers coach in year three. Um, so there's definitely been a little bit of instability there. And I know on a lot of these kids, you know, that can halt development. 
um, in some cases, you know, just having that inconsistency at coaching positions and at play calling positions and philosophical positions. But certainly you have to think that, you know, a reunion with Cristobal has to feel uh, like it's on his radar. And he ha- and he's already told me uh, that a couple of Oregon players or a couple of uh, a couple of Miami players who actually transferred to Oregon um, have been reaching out to him and contacting him. Uh, or excuse me, that transferred to uh, to Miami, Miami from Oregon. Oregon. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's been it's it, early, you know, early, man. It's early. You know, you're not used to waking up at this hour of the day. <laughs> we'll work with you, Zuby and I. We got you, man. But yeah, these guys, you know, they have been coming. Uh, they they have been uh, reaching out to him. They've been contacting him, and he said that he's interested in any program that's interested in him. And right now, it definitely sounds like the pieces are going to be there for Miami to show some interest in him on December fifth. All right, Azubi, you were an all star wide receiver over there on the southwest coast of Florida. If you had gone all the way to the Pacific Northwest to go to college instead of coming to work with Canesport. And um, you played two seasons and only caught 26 balls. You might want to look to get a little closer to home, right? Yeah, I'll put it in the words of LeBron James. I'm taking my talents to South Beach. I'm leaving (laughs) the Pacific Northwest, and I'm coming to sunny South Florida and reunite with my former coach. But, you know, all jokes aside, like Steven mentioned, he has big play capability. He has a size. He has a frame all that good stuff, and that's something Miami is really lacking. And if I'm a prospect in the portal, I'm looking my chops thinking, hey, I can come in Miami and be that guy almost immediately. So I feel like that's almost, I wouldn't say a match made in heaven, but it's a pretty good fit for me if I I do say so myself. All right, before I go any further, what's that beeping thing? Where is that coming from? Is that? I think I I got to change my batteries in my – and my fire. Oh, just, your fire. Uh, yeah, your smoke detector. Yeah, smoke that's, detector. that's what it is. Yes, yeah. I, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, what, what you do is you get a chair or some ladder. You, you, you take it down. It twists to the left. You replace the battery, and it won't beep ever again. Uh, yeah. At least not for a few years. <laughs> we'll get that situated pretty soon. <laughs> I keep hearing that beep. I'm like, what the heck is that thing? All right, we got a couple more stories to talk about. Um, but first, let's hear from our sponsors. Let's start with Canesware and then Life Wallet. Welcome to Canesware. Family owned and operated since 2010, Canesware has all the latest merchandise for the Miami Hurricanes, Miami Dolphins, Inner Miami Soccer, and more. Come visit us at our store in Davie on University Drive, just south of I-595, or online at Canesware.com. Canesware, the spot Miami fan shop. Hey, sis, want to play one-on-one? What about three-on-three? Let's do it. Wait a minute. Life Wallet user not detected. I knew it. Secure your health information and privacy with Life Wallet. Life Wallet. Saving time, saving lives. Okay, I'm not 100% certain what Life Wallet's actually advertising. All I know is that there were a lot of Haley's. <laughs> a lot of Hannah's, too. Uh, yeah, like so. If we threw out a basketball, we started out with uh, with you, Stephen, and you and Zuby, and let you, you know, pick one of your uh, one of your compatriots to join you and go three on three against the Cavender twins plus one. Who wins? Oh, the Cavenders! Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's not even close. That's not even a competition. I'd be lucky if I get a bucket. <laughs> All right, let's um, let, let's move on to. Uh, and by the way, you know. You're right. Like you watch that commercial and you don't really walk away with a sense of what life wallet is. And uh, one of the things that John Ruiz is talking about in his expanded um, NIL program for 2023 is he wants to do a better job in his commercials of explaining what life wallet is. So 
we'll, we'll, we'll probably see some production adjustments here uh, <laughs> right when they start the 2023 production schedule, which should crank up pretty soon now that football season's over and the players are more available to do commercial shoots. So um, we'll keep an eye on that. All right, so continuing recruiting, uh, there's a safety, a five-star safety uh, from New Iberia, Louisiana, by the name of Derek Williams. And, uh, you know, he is a guy that Miami has very quietly continued to recruit, even though he verbally committed to Texas on June the 27th. And um, Stephen, this is another story. I, I talked about how, how hard you've been working and uh, you've been, you've been, you've been grinding, no doubt. And this is another one that we put you on and we said, Steven, go find out what is up with this Derek Williams kid and, uh, ran into a little bit of road, uh, roadblock in that Derek Williams won't talk to anybody. So being the intrepid reporter that Steven is, he went to the next best thing and he talked to Derek's coach and he got an update on exactly where Derek is in his recruitment, what might be Miami's chances as things move forward. And Stephen uh, came away from that story, uh, and everybody can read it on the website this morning. Uh, it's pretty obvious to me that that commitment to Texas is a little loose. Yeah, mum's the word out of Derek right now. And to be honest, it kind of surprised me because he was part of that uh, that that kind of uh, that kind of. Uh, I'm really struggling for the word here, but that 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 group or I guess that horde of recruits that uh, committed to Texas right after Arch Manning's commitment uh, there in late June. And uh, it, at the time, it really felt like, okay, yeah, you know, these guys, they're going to follow Arch to Texas. You know, Arch is kind of, you know, he's, he's taking Texas's recruiting on his back. Um, but after talking with uh, Derek's coach, um, I, I don't necessarily feel like that is a 100% firm, hard commitment to Texas. I think there's still a lot of wiggle room. Um, I think there's still a good chance that uh, he ends up elsewhere. Um, I don't think it's nearly as hard as Texas fans probably initially thought that that, uh, that, that commitment was. Um, and uh, he told me, Derek's coach told me, that even though uh, right now, he certainly has a lot on the, or Derek certainly has a lot on the table. He's certainly evaluating a lot of his options right now. He really just wants to focus on his high school football season. Uh, his team's in the state semifinals this week. Uh, so best of luck to them, obviously moving forward. Uh, but he really wants to focus on uh, winning a state championship with his high school right now, um, which is, you know, kind of funnily the, the same kind of mentality approach that, uh, that Arch Manning had. Um, you know, just kind of heads, you know, head down. I want to focus on being a high school senior. And after the season's over, he does plan on making a full evaluation. He does plan on coming out and saying something. Uh, but whether that's this week, whether that's next week, I mean, you know, that's that's kind of up to him and uh, and how his high school performs this week. Um, but uh, certainly um, a lot of eyeballs are on this one. He is a five star safety. Miami right now does not have a safety committed um, in this class. And you've got to think five star at any position. I don't care what it is, the more the merrier. You'll take them. All right. Um, on another note, uh, today we continue our analysis of the Miami Hurricanes roster rebuild with a closer look at what's going on at the tight end position. So make sure you check that out. And um, just in case you might have been thinking that while Steven's been doing all this work, Azubi's been laying out at the beach or something. Uh, we actually got Azubi out to Canes basketball uh, last night, and uh, Azubi, man, that that was worth the trip, man. Um, wow, what a game! And uh, Rutgers was a pretty feisty opponent, man. They uh, they bring it and they play really really hard. And they they're very athletic and they're very long, and they were disrupt disrupting Miami's guards and scoring was a struggle for a while. But then in the second half of the second half. The Canes, I thought Azubi showed their class a little bit. Um, I thought all those guys, um, you know, from uh, Pack and Wong to Jordan Miller, um, they all kind of found their way to make an impact on that game. And uh, lo and behold, when the clock reached zero, they were six-point victors, man. So uh, give us your thoughts on what you saw 
uh, last night at the Watsco Center. Yeah, last night at Watsco was absolutely rocking. My first impression was, wow, this place is actually really packed tonight for Rutgers. And the players felt that same energy from the crowd, just boost them along. In the first half, Miami really, really struggled from the three-point field goal line. I think they had one three coming into half compared to Rutgers, who was shooting five for nine. That was a big emphasis that Coach L told the team headed into the half, said, hey, guys, buckle down. This is a Miami basketball and coming out in the second half, Rutgers continued to pound Miami. I think they started the second half on a 16 to 2 run. Double digit lead. Coach L called the timeout, regrouped the guys, and then Jordan Miller and Isaiah Wong really took over. I mean, I uh Nigel Pack didn't have the best shooting game, but when his time was called, he really, you know, came up. He tied the game with a big three at 56 all with six minutes left. And then from there on out, Miami really put in cruise control and you know, sent Rutgers back to New Jersey with the big L. But Watsco Center was awesome. I love what I saw from Miami. The only thing I would say is they struggled on the boards against a bigger physical team. Last time that happened versus Maryland, they lost their lone loss this season, but somehow they found a way. Jordan Miller finished with 10 rebounds. Norchad was one rebound away from another double-double. So they found a way to win, which is amazing to see. And now they head to ACC play against Louisville on the road to open up ACC play. So really excited from what I've seen from these guys this year. and really have really high hopes for them. The guy that really like jumped out to me is that nobody would even think about is Bensley Joseph. I mean, he was unbelievable in that game last night. I don't think he scored four points, but he was making play after play all over the floor on both sides. I mean, just uh, was rebounding and showing his athleticism and uh, playmaking and setting up other guys for scores and harassing Rutgers and, uh, might have been the MVP of the game, quite frankly, because uh, he's not the best player on the team. But the other guys were sort of uneven, largely because Rutgers was pretty good and was challenging them uh, and and matching up on defense and doing a really good job. And uh, they needed the energy and the efficiency of Bensley Joseph last night. And uh, that's what I love about this team is they got different guys that they can that they can rely on and uh, Azubi, I think they're a little thin. I, I think they're short. One big guy, uh, AJ Casey, really needs to come along for them. Um, but uh, they're going to be a handful every single game. And other than the Maryland game where they just kind kind of like bullied, um, you know, it, it was the back a back to back game, second night of the back to back, and a bigger, more physical team just bullied them. Uh, they're having a pretty nice season, and it's going to be interesting to see how they do when ACC play starts on Sunday against Louisville. So uh, we'll look forward to that. All right, we're going to, again, wish Matt Chaudel uh, a, a good recovery from his COVID and hope that he'll be rejoining us on this show in the very near future. Um, and uh, we'll make sure he drinks a lot of ginger juice and honey and all the kind of things that will nurse him back to health so that he can – grace you guys with his presence uh, in the morning when you guys wake up. Uh, but we thank you so much for starting your day out with us. And um, we're going to call it a day on Good Morning Cane Sports so Azubi can get up on a chair and change that alarm that keeps beeping in the background. How in the world are you able to sleep in your apartment with that thing beeping every two minutes? I think it's just second nature this one. I just tune it out now. Now that you mentioned it, I'm like, hmm, maybe I should go up there and change it. I'll definitely get a change for next episode tomorrow yeah, morning. Yeah, you know how it works, right? You just screw it kind of to the left. It's like kind of like a screw, and it opens up, and there's a battery in there. So best of luck with that. Um, Steven, uh, we'll let you get off on another uh, big day of, uh, of recruiting coverage. And we thank you guys for starting out your day with us. Uh, thank you to Life Wallet and to Canesware for sponsoring today's show. So for Azubi Charles. And Stephen Wagner, I'm Gary Furman. You guys have a great day, everybody.